welcome, Haverhill community. Uh, I'm Rick Harrington. I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And welcome to the first episode of our show, Faith in Haverhill, which has that nice double meaning. Uh, we're exploring uh, theology and ethics and current events here in the community of Haverhill. And we have faith in Haverhill. This is our city. We love our city. So I want to uh, introduce you to our first guest uh, for today, and that is Mitch Foreman. So welcome, Mitch. Hi, uh, Pastor Rick. Nice to be here. Great to have you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So let's, uh, let's just start, Mitch, with uh, maybe you telling us a little bit about yourself and your, your personal life. We'll, we'll get to your ministry and all that, but mm. just tell us about your family and, and, your, and how you're related to Haverhill. Well, I have lived in Haverhill for the past 11 years. I moved up here uh, because my family owned a company that is very well known in the area called Boston Coffee Cake. Okay, so, so, so when we buy those those delicious uh, coffee cakes at the store. That's, that's, your, that's your family recipe. That's my family <laughs> recipe. In fact, uh, it's my grandmother's recipe that my uh, brothers took and have um, made a delicious cake. And I'm sure many of the listeners uh, or wa- people who are watching the show mm-hmm. um, have eaten. And um, that's what brought us up to this area. And I've noticed that if you, if you read the box, it says there's a little note there from Mark Foreman. And, that's and who's correct. Mark Foreman? Mark Foreman is my brother, twin brother. Twin brother. And he lives up in the area as well. And so we, uh, for the most part, have grown up uh, on the North Shore. I was born and raised in Peabody, Massachusetts, and to a Jewish home. So when we talk about faith, my faith started off very early by being raised in a Jewish home in the 60s and 70s. And um, Pastor Rick, when I was being raised, Judaism was a little bit different than it is today. And we're going to talk about how your Jewish ethnicity has played into your whole life, into your ministry. But uh, married? Mm-hmm. I'm married. I have a wife named Kina who you know quite well because yep. she works at First Baptist Church, and that's, that's right. how we got connected uh, to, to First Baptist Church. Absolutely. Yeah. I have three wonderful kids who are involved in the Havel School system and just enjoy living here, and I am so excited about having a show that will talk about different aspects of faith, because it's not just going to be the Christian faith that we both share, Mm -hmm. but different aspects of how other people look at faith. And I appreciate that you are having a show that will examine some of these things and maybe even delve into some questions and answers that the average person uh, watching might not know about. Yeah, definitely. We want to keep it, uh, keep it lively. So there'll yeah. be some, some hard questions we'll throw at you too. Okay, too okay. Don't up. make them too hard. Though. <laughs> we'll try not to. We'll try not to. <laughs> so. All right. So, and you're also, uh, so professionally and uh, for full time, yeah. you are the Vice President of Chosen People Ministries. Uh, that's correct. Uh, Chosen People Ministries is a ministry that focuses on bringing the gospel to Jewish people. Mm-hmm. And I am the Vice President of the United States. We are worldwide. Mm-hmm. We are the oldest Jewish ministry in the United States. Started in 1894 when Rabbi Leopold Cohn heard the gospel in Yiddish in the Lower East Side of New York City. And he started the ministry and we've been going strong uh, for over 120 years. Okay, great. Uh, For a lot of our listeners who may know Jewish ministries, uh, the term, the, the, the ministry Jews for Jesus comes to mind. So what's the relationship Correct. between chosen people and Jews for Jesus? Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of people think that if you're a Jewish person and you become a believer of Jesus, you're in the group Jews for Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's not exactly the case. There is a group called Jews for Jesus. In fact, I was with them for many years. But they are a organization committed to bringing the gospel to Jewish people. But that is an actual organization. That's the name. But it's kind of become like Kleenex, where the name of the organization is representing something much bigger. Okay. So Jews for Jesus is an organization, but many people in the Jewish community would think if you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus, you have joined that organization. Okay. All right. Now, you've already alluded to the fact that you grew up Jewish. Correct. And um, when you say you grew up Jewish, you mean you grew up in a, a ethnically Jewish home, Correct. but also practicing Judaism. And, Correct. And define that distinction. And then we're going to talk about how you came to faith in Jesus. And, and Correct. Because that, that gets kind of complicated sometimes because Judaism is, is, a, is the faith being Jewish is your ethnic. Okay. But they're together right from the beginning when you're born. So, for example, you're born Jewish. You know, the average male is circumcised on the eighth day, and that's when you're Jewish, according to the Jewish law. Okay. 
-hmm. Now, what you believe, there's many different things that you can believe as, uh, as a Jew, but when I was being raised, your cultural identity is based on where you go to synagogue. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish world is, at that point was divided pretty systematically into three groups. Uh, the two largest groups dealt with more of a, a secular viewpoint of Judaism. I was raised in a reformed uh, synagogue, and that's about 40% of the Jewish people when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So that would be what most people would say is the most liberal or secular form of Judaism. Mm -hmm. Then you have conservative Judaism. That's the, another 40%. Similar to reformed Judaism, but their worship a little bit more... Um, um, Orthodox, a uh, little longer, and those people uh, involved in that temple might keep kosher, might not drive on the Sabbath. Some of uh, um, the things that a Reformed synagogue probably wouldn't uphold. Okay. And then finally, about 6-7% of the Jewish people are actually Orthodox. And uh, those are the people that you would see that would wear a covering on their head that we call a keeper. They would not drive on the Sabbath. They keep kosher. Their world is based on how many of the Jewish laws that they could actually follow. Okay. So growing up, you mm. didn't eat kosher? And growing up, we did not keep a kosher home because in a Reformed synagogue, that really wasn't the practice. Okay. My grandparents did. Okay. In fact, almost all of my friends growing up, all of our grandparents were Orthodox. They worshipped in an Orthodox synagogue and they kept kosher. Okay. So I but ate I, much kosher food growing up because of my grandparents. Okay. All right. So no bacon, no lobster. Uh, yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, what now, but you did celebrate the, the Jewish holidays. Correct. Okay. Which is, uh, again, very important in the Jewish home. Mm -hmm. Not only did I go to synagogue, a lot of the holidays are actually celebrated in the home. So for Passover, we'd go to my grandparents' house to celebrate it. When the holidays of Hanukkah come up, you're not celebrating that in the home. In the synagogue, you usually celebrate those in the home. Um, the idea of the Sabbath is the biggest uh, time where you would go to the synagogue because as Christians worship on s Sunday, Jewish people worship on Saturday. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, yeah. this, you grew up Jewish and in a, in a Reformed Jewish home, you came to believe in Jesus. And I don't know if you'd use the term converted, we can talk about that later maybe, yeah. but you came to believe in Jesus as a savior, as your savior. How did, how did that happen? Because that's, that's an unusual thing to happen. You, you at least it is. It. When I was being raised, there was no such things as Jewish people believing in Jesus. There were, but it wasn't well known. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a neighborhood that you were either Jewish or Catholic. So all of my friends, you, they were either Jewish or Catholic, and I knew growing up there were some differences in, the, in, in those two faiths. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest ones is... Christians worship on Sunday and Jewish people worship on Saturday. Um, growing up, we believed Jewish people read the Old Testament only, Christians read the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference is that Christians believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And growing up in a Jewish home, we believe in the Messiah, but it's just not Jesus. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for the Messiah to come. But I was always told by my Catholic friends, you know, Jesus was Jewish. And my rabbis would always tell us in response, yeah, but he converted to being a Catholic. He converted being, to Catholic. Yeah, okay. so that he started this whole other religion. Okay. So he's no longer Jewish. He converted. He didn't get the Jewish people to believe in who he was. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I, I believed that Jesus was the Messiah for Gentiles, but not for Jewish people, and that we were waiting. And when he would come, there'd be world peace, and that's how we would know. Would you say there was kind of a negative view of Jesus overall in your home, or was it kind of neutral? Not in my that's home. for them, not, not for us, but that's for them. Rick, some homes, yes. Some there homes, is yes. some anti-Jesus you know, Jesus sentiment. Okay. Okay. In my home, not, not really. Okay. Okay. I grew up uh, when my dad told me to respect people of all faith, mm -hmm. but we held on to ours as well. So mm -hmm. as long as nobody ridiculed us for being Jewish, which I very rarely got growing up, okay. there was no conflict growing up in my home. So, now, how did you come to... Well, uh, when I was growing up, as most uh, Jewish boys and girls, we had a bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. or bar mitzvah at 13. You get to perform some of the functions in the synagogue. And kind of like in the Christian world, having a confirmation. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the end of my faith 
uh, being celebrated in the synagogue. And then I just, for the most part, just came and uh, did well in school, went to college. Uh, however, this funny idea kept on coming up into my head, which, you know, why were all these Gentiles celebrating and worshiping a Jewish guy? Mm -hmm. And growing up in a Jewish home, we're not really allowed to read the New Testament. So I didn't know much about it. All I knew was that Jesus was Jewish. I think most Jewish people know that. Mm -hmm. But we don't know exactly how he blended the two or whatever. So I was always, always very curious about it. So when you go to college, obviously a good time to examine some of these things because sure. you're away from home. You have access to maybe some classes that you wouldn't have in high school. Mm -hmm. So I went to UMass and I took a class in the history of the Bible. And that was my introduction. In fact, I had never read the Bible. It might seem strange mm -hmm. that growing up Jewish, <coughs> Jewish people, the way that we study is a little bit different than just opening up the Bible. So that was my first time of reading the Bible in that class. And we read, you know, stories in the Old Testament were very exciting because I had been told a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, by my rabbis, by, by my grandparents. I knew about King David. I knew about Abraham. I had never read it in the Bible, so reading those stories was very exciting for me. Okay. But our textbook was both the old and the new, and I determined that I was not going to open up to the New Testament until that time of class because I, I didn't know what to expect. I just figure, uh, like most Jewish people, the Old Testament is talking about Jews, and the New Testament talks about Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So I figured we'll eventually get to it. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was a Monday morning in class, and the teacher said, we're done with the old, and now we're going to start studying the new. And we opened up to the first chapter of Matthew, and I was shocked because I was expecting it to be a book about Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament starts off, as you well know, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Rick, sure. this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And as I was reading it, it struck me that, that that's a very Jewish genealogy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it goes into his genealogy, and as we started to read the New Testament, I started to see it from a different perspective because I'm just reading it from a cultural standpoint, and it sounds very Jewish. Mm -hmm. I had no idea Peter and Paul were Jewish. Mm -hmm. I thought they were Catholic. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Peter wrote a good portion of it. That's correct. Very fact, prominent people, Jewish people in the New Testament. Right. In fact, there's probably only one Gentile author in the New Testament. Is that right? That's Which, right. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be Luke. Yes. Okay. And that so. shocked me that most of the New Testament is talking about Jewish people who have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And we know very well from the New Testament that Paul then took this message to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that the gospel message that Jesus came and died for my sins was presented. It might have been. I just, I don't remember that being part of the class. Mm -hmm. But that was my introduction of who Jesus was. And I was kind of excited the fact that he was Jewish. And also remember at that time, uh, many, many years ago, you know, a very famous Jewish person who had come to believe in Jesus and had sent shockwaves to the Jewish community, and that was Bob Dylan. Okay, yep. And, and my thinking was, Bob Dylan was kind of cool, mm -hmm. but he was very Jewish, and why would a cool Jewish guy come to believe in Jesus? Mm -hmm. And he kind of opened up the door for, I think, Jewish people to examine who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say that he was the main reason why I did it, but he helped open up the door for me because I figured if Bob Dylan could do it, why can't I okay. un understand it? Right. And so, as I said, UMass was the place where I first uh, read about it. Later on, um, I, I started to um, prepare for, for my um, career in culinary arts. I was a chef. And I cooked in some of the better places in Boston. Uh, happy to, to say that my pedigree in the cooking world is the Ritz Carlton, the Parker House, okay. Hotel Meridian, and I got a very, very good foundation. And then I went out to California because in the 80s, that's where everything was happening. Okay. And I moved to San Francisco and I got caught up in the culture. I uh, worked at some of the best restaurants in the world out there, but I also part 
took in a lot of things that were not good for me. <coughs> so I got involved in drugs and alcohol, and that started to kind of have an effect on my cooking life as well, because you can't cook at that level and still do a lot of drugs and drinking. I mean, some people can, I could not. So I lost my job at one of the most well-known restaurants in the world, and that was devastating for me, Rick, because it was the first time that I had ever lost my job. It was the first time that I actually got kind of depressed, you know, because I had always maintained, you know, my life pretty well. And to get fired and then just kind of move around from job to job, I started to flounder. You're still single at this time? I'm You're... still single at this time, that's correct. And I finally have to just take a job cooking sandwiches at a restaurant just to make money, just to make ends meet. And um, it was there that I had befriended uh, another person who worked there. It was a uh, Korean Christian girl. Mm -hmm. And we became friends, and she started to slowly start to share some things about the Bible uh, that I didn't know about. She asked me some questions. And it was really her that started um, my search for Jesus again. Mm -hmm. And she actu actually asked me a question that changed my life. And it might be a question that others have asked Jewish people, but for me, um, it kind of stuck. And one day as we were talking, she just bluntly asked me, why don't Jewish people believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Mm -hmm. And I said, because I'm Jewish. Most Jewish people feel like, you know, we're Jews. He's for Gentiles. Yeah. And she said, but he's in your Bible. Hmm. And that struck me very funny because I never remembered reading about Jesus in my Bible. Okay. Meaning what the Old Testament. What we would call the Old That's Testament. right, the Old Testament. Uh, Jewish people use the term Jewish he, scriptures. Hebrew scriptures, or Jewish scriptures. Hebrew, Old Testament almost refers to that it's old, there's it's passé. It's an assumption that it's passed. That's right. And we know that that's not true. Because without the old, the, the New Testament doesn't make any sense. That's right. But I thought that that was an odd statement. So the Bible that I had from that class in UMass, I had always kept with me. Because mm -hmm. in Judaism, not only do we have our laws, we have a lot of traditions, and we have a lot of superstitious mm -hmm. things as well. And one of the superstitions is that you can't throw away a Bible. Mm -hmm. It has the name of God in it, so you can't defame it. So I always, I didn't read it, I just carried it with me. Okay. So when she asked me that question, I thought, I'm going to see if Jesus' name is in the Old Testament. And as I went home and opened up the Bible, you know, God is working, I believe, in my life, too, without me knowing it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I was curious of whether Jesus' name was in the Old Testament, but I was actually led more to open up the New Testament. And it was there that I really encountered who Jesus really is. And it really started, the words just started to take hold of me and started to befriend Jesus, as I call it, mm -hmm. and realized that, wow, maybe he could be my answer to my problems. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking in the Bible for that. Okay. But it's not unlike God to know exactly what you are and who you are and what you need. And that was uh, the beginning of my faith walk. Mm -hmm. I had some questions, too, about Jesus from the New Testament that I asked her that she couldn't answer. So she recommended that I speak to a pastor uh, in a local church, but I didn't know how to do that. So luckily, the restaurant I was working in, the hostess um, uncle was a pastor. Okay. And this was First Baptist Church of Carmel Valley. I was living in uh, the area of Carmel, Pebble Beach. I went to see him, and he was really the pastor that shared with me the gospel. Okay. So that's kind of a long-winded story, no, but a, that's my story <clears throat> of how a nice Jewish boy from Peabody came to know about Jesus. Okay. All right. And from, from that point forward, Mitch, you just this would say, did you get involved in a, a church and started going to that church on a regular basis? And I, I started to go to the church. I was not yet a Christian mm -hmm. because there's a term that we use in Messianic ministry, about Jewish people of counting the cost. Mm -hmm. I had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but I did not accept him as such because there's some cultural barriers mm -hmm. that Jewish people have to overcome that was true when I was um, contemplating it, was true 2,000 years ago, true today. Okay. A couple of them, and a lot of them aren't <laughs> basically true, but it's our perception. One, if you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus, you stop being Jewish that you become Gentile. 
That is a myth, but that is very common among most Jewish people. Okay. okay. Well, before we get there, Mitch, yeah. your role at, as vice president oh. of Chosen People Ministries, what, what are you doing there? So now the, the ministry itself mm. is trying to bring the gospel or, or the message of Jesus to Jewish people. To Jewish people, but from a Jewish perspective and by Jews. We want Jewish people to know that you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. Okay. We want Jewish people to know that there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish people all over this country that do believe, so that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And probably the third thing is we want Jewish people to know that the message in the New Testament is not new. It's contained in the Old Testament, and God intended for the Jewish people to embrace it. Okay. So our ministry is there to help Jewish people embrace the idea that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Okay. Okay. And you, you, in your role, do you do a lot of you do a lot of teaching? You do a lot of administration, kind of a mixture of, of different. Well, things? my role is because I've been in Jewish ministry for 25 years. Uh, I oversee a lot of the ministry that we do. Okay. I help others in our ministry do what God has called them to do. Okay. So, as most vice presidents, sometimes you get off the field, but you help others maintain their ministry in the field. So we have many um, people in our organization that have started what we call Messianic congregations. Mm -hmm. These are Jewish style churches, but they meet on Saturday predominantly filled with Jews who believe in Jesus so that there'll be a place a Jewish person might feel comfortable going to examine their faith and to express their faith. Okay. So we, messianic meaning <clears throat> following the Messiah. That's so, correct. That, that Jesus is the Messiah. So they're, that's correct. Okay. It's modeled both after a synagogue service and a church, so okay. they combine the two. Okay. We have camps where young Jewish kids can, who are messianic Jews and growing up can embrace their messianic lifestyle, but bring Jewish friends and family members to go to camp and understand about Jesus as well. We do a lot of evangelism. We own a site called Isaiah53.com, which we use a lot to try to get Jewish people to understand that Jesus is in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. predominantly seen through his suffering. Okay. So, so here's where I said we're going to get a little edgy. Okay. So I can imagine uh, some of our <laughs> listeners out there, um, maybe who are Jewish, yep. are, are maybe a little offended at this point. They're saying, you're trying to change me. You're trying to change my belief system. You told us your story. That's okay right. for you. Uh, but why are you now spending time trying to change other people's opinion and why not let them be Jewish? And right. how would you respond to that? Well, that has been raised many times. Mm -hmm. And when I told you when you become a believer in Jesus, if you're Jewish, I think the Jewish community would just prefer that you say you're Christian mm -hmm. and that you've given up your Jewishness and you enter that world. So there is this barrier. <clears throat> However, I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. I like being Jewish. I like celebrating the holidays. I want Jewish people to know too, point blank, that you can maintain your Jewish culture and identity and still believe in Jesus. Because what I would like my Jewish uh, listeners and, 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 and people who are watching this show to understand today is that everything Jesus did was in the confines of being Jewish. He understood that all the laws pertaining to his life was from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The idea of that God is going to send the Messiah is a Jewish idea. It wasn't invented by Gentiles. It's a Jewish idea that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So I would love for my Jewish people to know that, you know, the idea of anybody being the Messiah is very Jewish. Mm -hmm. The question is, is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? And I would challenge anybody to go back and read the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the Messiah and tell me that they don't all point to Jesus. Give us an example. Give us a, a couple of examples of what you mean by that. Example, the, the, the Old Testament is very specific on where the Messiah must be born, okay. Bethlehem. It's found in the, um, the writings of Micah, but it's very, very clear that you know, God is going to send the Messiah and he will come from Bethlehem. Well, it's well known in the New Testament that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem. The idea of a, how he'll be born, the virgin birth, which I thought was very Christian and Gentile. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a verse that says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son. I had no idea that that was in the Jewish scriptures. Mm -hmm. So Isaiah tells us how he will be born. 
well, Rick, do you know of anybody else who claims to be born from a virgin? Hmm. No, not that I know of. Not that I know right. of. Right. <laughs> Jesus was. Is yeah. that a oh, oh, besides Jesus. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so is that a coincidence? Or when you read the New <clears throat> Testament, I like to think of it as a puzzle. The Old Testament is a puzzle, and there's all these different prophecies. And then when you put them all together, where he'll be born, how he'll be born, what he's going to do. He will be someone who will bring miracles. Uh, Isaiah 2 talks about a, a Messiah that will come and, you know, make blind people see and deaf hear. Well, we know that Jesus did that. Mm -hmm. And when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together in the New Testament, you have one beautiful picture of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's made up. It's the perfect plan of God. Just to push it a little further, yeah, sure. Which, uh, you have uh, so we have you know this is faith in Haverhill. We have uh, Jewish synagogues in Haverhill, mm -hmm. and you've met some of the the rabbis here in Haverhill, I think. I have, okay. and like I said, one of the difficulties is when you're Jewish and you say that you believe in Jesus, you're not allowed in the Jewish community. There's a, I would say, a little fear factor there. They're afraid that I'm going to go in and start <coughs> preaching the gospel to everybody. Mm -hmm. I would always welcome anybody to understand my story. I would never deny Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I love my people, and I am very Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I love going to synagogue. I love celebrating the holidays with my people. Mm -hmm. So I, I know, though, that it is a barrier. So I don't push it. That's why I think a lot of us have developed our own services, our own events. Mm -hmm. However, I have uh, uh, um, reached out to the to, to the rabbi in Haverhill, mm -hmm. okay, and let him know who we are as a family and what we do. And that's how did, all how did I he can respond do. to that? Did, was he... I think his response was uh, somebody that um, reflected what the average Jewish person uh, would think is that that's good for you, mm -hmm. but go do it in a church, okay. okay, because you believe in Jesus. That is the that's the linchpin. It all focuses in, on him, and it's not just because he claims to be the Messiah, Rick. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties is, as I mentioned to you before as we were preparing for this, you know, the cultural divide that Jesus has done within the Jewish community by people who said that they were Christians. Mm -hmm. You don't hear much about this growing up in a church, but growing up Jewish, you know, I was told the Crusades by Christians wearing crosses on their, you know, shields, mm -hmm. went down to Jerusalem and killed many, many, many Jewish people mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. The, the pogroms in Russia, where my family comes out of, if anybody here has ever watched Fiddler on the Roof, mm -hmm. very real, where the Cossacks and those who said that they were Christian kicked out the Jewish people just for being Jewish. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultural <coughs> enmity, I call it, mm -hmm between Jews and Christians, because in the name of Jesus, a lot of bad things have happened to Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So somehow, when you become a Jewish person and believe in Jesus, you're almost seen as joining the enemy. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very emotional. Yeah. I know mm -hmm. that, you know, for example, if, you know, because like I said, Jew Jewishness is an ethnicity as well. Right. If we said we're going to try to reach Korean people, <laughs> there wouldn't be any real controversy over that. You, know? you wouldn't expect Korean people to stop being Korean because they believe in exactly Jesus. Exactly right. But right. Uh, there is this very, there's a great sensitivity to the idea of you know, Jewish people, you should not try to evangelize. You should not try to bring them to Jesus. You should just leave them to themselves. And so Correct. it's an uphill battle, what you're, what you're trying to do. And I'm sure it's very controversial at times. It is. But I also noticed, Mitch, if I could say so, that mm -hmm. you know you have a, a gentle way about it. You're not you're not trying to force it down anyone's throat. You are saying that being a Jewish and being a Christian are not contradictory ideas. Right. Certainly, in your own life, you found redemption in Jesus, and that you would want others to to find that same redemption. Exactly, because uh, in my life, you know, after I got by Mitzvah, I I lived pretty much as an American. Mm -hmm. I didn't celebrate all the holidays. It wasn't as important. I never stopped being Jewish in my mind. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is that when you talk to other Jewish people, faith is not generally the number one topic. Mm -hmm. Like if I walked into a synagogue, the first question isn't, do you believe in God? Mm -hmm. uh, Jewish people believe in a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. You can go to the Jewish community and learn about Buddha. Mm -hmm. You can learn about Hinduism. You can learn about New Age. So Jewish people do get um, other faith involved in their learning process, and it doesn't stop making them 
Jewish. Mm -hmm. the, the difficulty, though, is it seems that <coughs> Jesus, if you embrace him, mm -hmm. it puts you outside of Judaism. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny, mm -hmm. in a sense, because all those other faith systems are outside of Judaism. Mm -hmm. They originated outside of the Jewish world, yeah. where Jesus is Jewish. He's advocating the fact that he's the Messiah, Jewish idea. Mm -hmm. So I've always questioned, why am I not considered Jewish when everything I believe about Jesus is Jewish? Mm -hmm. I believe in a Jewish rabbi who lived, mm -hmm. who taught Jewish things and claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. <laughs> uh, okay. As far as I'm concerned, that's the most Jewish thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in a sense, welcomes in. Gentiles <laughs> into in, into faith. So it began with Israel. He's he's reaching the Jews, and then he's welcoming in in the Gentiles to faith as well. Correct, yeah. and that's one of the mysteries I think that Jesus brought to the yeah. table. The idea that God created the Jewish people to bring this gospel message to the world mm -hmm. was not something that the Jewish people uh, were expecting. Mm -hmm. It's in our scriptures in Isaiah. It talks about that the Jewish people would be a light to the world. Okay. Um, I don't think that we realize that that light would be the light of the world, mm -hmm. Jesus. Okay. So did the gospel go out to the rest of the nations? It certainly has because I'm sitting here talking to a pastor at a church mm -hmm. predominantly filled with non-Jewish people. Right. Yeah. So I think when Jewish people see churches, they see a lot of non-Jewish people think it's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And what I see is the exact plan of God coming to fruition, mm -hmm. that the Jewish message of Jesus went out to the world, and it's wonderful that, that, that God and his plan would see that everybody, both Jew and Gentile, could embrace Jesus. Mm -hmm. Good. And, now, what would you say, Mitch, um, uh, how can we be, so like, as we said, there's a lot of uh, synagogues in Haverhill, there's a lot of rabbis, and we may have some on the show in the future, and they'll be, certainly right. be welcome. Um, mm -hmm. How can we be sensitive to that history mm -hmm. of the Crusades, of that animosity, um, and at the same time, still show the, the, want to share the love of Christ. How can those who are not Jewish, like right. myself, how can we uh, recognize how, how to be sensitive to that divide? Mm. You know, you look at the current events and you see that sort of uh, religion is now at the center of, of what's going on in the world and is causing a lot of division uh, with Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Um, uh, I can see the, the struggle of, uh, of being in Jewish ministries in that context. How can mm. we be sensitive? To our Jewish neighbors, and at the same time, you know, still want them to 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 hear about Jesus at the same time. Great question, Rick. Mm -hmm. Because um, one of the main um, understandings of our ministry is not only to bring the gospel to Jewish people, but I want to train and equip the church to be able to do it too. Because mm -hmm. the average Jewish person will come to know about Jesus from somebody not Jewish, mm -hmm. just like me. Mm -hmm. But there's a tension. The tension is, I believe, a lot of Christians would love to see Jewish people come to faith. Mm -hmm. The tension might be that if you bring the subject up to your Jewish friends or neighbors, that they're not going to like you. Mm -hmm. So I know about that tension. So here's a couple of hints or ideas that might help. Jewish people don't know much about Jesus. We don't read the New Testament. We know that he claimed to be the Messiah and that he died for sins. That we know, but we don't accept it. So what can a Christian do to help a Jewish person embrace it? Well, I would say that don't be afraid of just sharing your faith. Okay, and not be afraid of telling a Jewish person what Jesus has done for you. Because one of the things that makes Jesus um, known throughout the world is that he helped me with my addictions by bringing me closer to him. He's helped millions and millions of people in the world come closer to God. Mm -hmm. So don't um, be afraid to just share your, 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 your testimony like I did this morning. Um, another thing that uh, Christians can do is to, you know, open up the scriptures. Maybe give a Bible to a Jewish person. Let them uh, <laughs> see who Jesus is just on their own. Not to push anything down anybody's throat but to, to make it available, okay? Because uh, you and I both agree that you can't force anybody to believe, and that's not what we would want anyway. Right. The Crusades were at completely out of line with what Jesus taught. There's no, there's no logical, I mean, even though there's a historic connection, those who claim Christ, right. 
there's no logical connection. They, they can't find in the teachings of Jesus any validation for what they've done. Nothing. Yeah, in fact, the exact opposite. Love and your neighbor as yourself. Those who take up the sword will die by the sword. There's continual commands to not try to force Christianity on people. Right. But nevertheless, it's part of the, the, the jaded who, history of, between Christians and Jews. That's right. Yeah. People who think that they understand it take a message and twist it. For example, Jesus did say, go out to the world and make disciples. Okay, but you don't force somebody to make disciples. What Jesus meant is share the gospel. Those who want to accept it, they can come in. That's what I love about sharing the gospel. It's like seeding. You plant the seed and just watch God make it grow. But we don't have to force anybody because I can never force anybody to believe. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about sharing the gospel. We don't have to force anybody to believe because you can't. Great. It's a message. We share it. And then we leave it in God's hands between right. them and God in their hearts. So. And Jesus says, share it out of love, mm -hmm. not fear. I don't want somebody to be afraid of me. <coughs> like, if you don't believe this, we're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's what happened with Jewish people. Mm -hmm. However, I believe one of the greatest ways that you could love a Jewish person is to share the gospel because we don't know it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that the, I think the church can do, especially here in Haverhill, Okay, and Rick, I'll, I'll speak to you personally, is make sure that the Jewish community does know that you love the Jewish people and that you will do things and will embrace who they are, whether they believe in Jesus or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you could want somebody to be a believer in Jesus knowing that, you know, not everybody might and maybe it will be a process. Okay, so can the church do something um, that would let the Jewish community know that they care about them? Yes. If there was something that was, you know, I think it was before I got here, but, you know, over the years there's been anti-Semitic stuff that happens to, you know, maybe the synagogue. Great opportunity for the church to stand up and say, we're not going to tolerate right. it and that. stand with the Jewish community. Somebody had painted swastikas on the, on the temple. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great opportunity. Yeah. Maybe it's a time where we would do a, at First Baptist a joint service on Holocaust Remembrance mm -hmm. Day that you want the synagogue to know that as Christians, you know, we love you and would love to know more about the Holocaust and understand, you know, your culture and maybe we'll do something together so that we can learn from both, you know, faith groups. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that, uh, you know, there are, is common ground mm -hmm. and I would look for opportunities to be able to do those things, okay? okay? And not just with the sole expression of, okay, we're going to convert Jews. Because, mm -hmm. again, that word convert is, is something that I um, would wish that your, your, the people <coughs> who, are, who are listening to us today who are Christian, the word convert to you means something different than what a Jewish person understands mm -hmm. that to be. It seems, in, in, a, in Jewish years, it seems much more aggressive, much more... Forceful. We Forceful to, into change. We uh, want to force you from not being Jewish to being mm -hmm. Christian. What would you say, Mitch, uh, mm -hmm. if somebody's singing, well, it still sounds like what, that's what happened to you, Mitch, that you, you converted from Judaism, to, uh, from Jewishness mm -hmm. to Christianity. Tell, tell us how being Jewish as a Christian has, has um, affected your life. For, for example, okay. I'll get you, uh, I got mm -hmm. to celebrate Hanukkah with you at your house. Right. You know, so you guys are still celebrating Hanukkah as a Jewish family. Uh, your wife's Jewish as Correct. well. Um, just explain how you're, you're not given up being Jewish at all. You are just now also a Christian, also a follower of yeah. Christ. In fact, I, I've embraced my Jewish life more mm -hmm. because it means a lot more to me. Mm -hmm. So I celebrate all the holidays uh, that, that are Jewish because I want to. Mm -hmm. Not because I have to, because I want to. Before, you know, growing up, we did some, we didn't do some. I enjoy it much more now. I'm the one that has, in our family, made sure that we do the Passover. And we do an extended version of it because I love taking the traditions of our people and just bringing it to my family. So I'm the one in my family that's looked at sometimes as the one that's upholding our Jewish culture. And it's coming from somebody who's a believer in Jesus. So my mom, my brother, my extended family who has not accepted Jesus as the Messiah, they look to me to help them celebrate their Jewishness. Mm -hmm. And that's all true <coughs> probably in a lot of other Messianic Jewish homes. Mm -hmm. So n not only have I not stopped being Jewish, from just a cultural, practical standpoint, I've become much more Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I love bringing that to my daughter. My daughter will have a bat mitzvah. 
that's right. Okay, which you'll be invited to. <laughs> okay, my, my kids are growing up in a home that's very unique, though, because they're growing up in a home that they are fully Jewish and fully believers in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So they get to experience both, and they think it's pretty cool. Okay, very good. Very good. Excellent. You know, I think part of the, the, the issue here is we've, we have a, a culture that's very sensitive to, towards tolerance. Correct. Cool. And as I understand, the old term of tolerance is you, you, you tolerate mm -hmm. people, but you fight about ideas. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you're, you're after truth, and you're able to argue with truth. But it's kind of shifted in its definition of we now tolerate all beliefs, which kind of removes that idea of truth. And, and so, it's, mm -hmm. Mitch, it sounds like what you're doing is saying we, we certainly tolerate people, all people. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, there's, no, there's no fight over that. But we can have good, hearty discussions about ideas and over, over truth and what is, what is right. So we consider the Old Testament. Does it point to Jesus? Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's exactly what we've tried to do in, in my world. My world, what we would call the messianic Jewish world. Yeah. Do we fight with the idea that we can be Jewish and believe in Jesus? Yeah, we fight it, but here's how we do it. By establishing our own institutions and creating our own communities. Um, I'm not going to sit there and try to beat you over the head. Please let us in. Please let us in. We would like that because, as I mentioned, the Jewish world invites a lot of different ideas of faith in the Jewish world except for one, okay. believing in Jesus. So when you talk about tolerance, Judaism in the Jewish world is very tolerant mm -hmm. of a lot of different faith, except being Jewish and believing in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we kind of feel like we're on the outside. Mm -hmm. So what we've done over the years is we've established our own congregations, our own music, our own, you know, our own uh, places of study. Mm -hmm. And by doing that over the years, we've grown. Mm -hmm. And when you have a movement of hundreds of thousands of Jewish people in that movement, you're no longer on the fringe, but we're being so big now. We are being recognized in some circles because of just the fact that we've sustained it, our beliefs. We're having a second and third generation who are upholding that. And we're starting to become a major player within Judaism. Mm -hmm. And so just by sheer numbers, we're able to now have dialogue. There are rabbis that will accept who we are. And... Rick, Do you I know the numbers? <coughs> Excuse me, Mitch. What percentage of, would you say, of Jewish people are Christians, followers of, of Christ? You know what? That's very difficult because it's not a, you know, one survey that talks a lot about it. Mm -hmm. But one of the dynamics that has happened lately, it came out in the last Pew report in Judaism, mm -hmm. that when I told you I grew up, it was pretty much defined that you were a Reformed, Conservative, or Orthodox. Right. And very little intermarriage. The last 40 years, a lot of intermarriage, and that has caused a lot of concern within the Jewish community because it does bring in other faiths. Mm -hmm. And predominantly, most of the Jewish people are marrying people who are probably raised Christian. Mm -hmm. Not saying they are Christian, but they probably bring that in. Sure. Celebrating Christmas and maybe Easter, even as a cultural standpoint, it's part of you know, a lot of Jewish people's lives right now. Mm -hmm. So in the last Pew report, there's roughly about five, five and a half million Jewish people in the United States. Okay. And 1.7 million Jewish people now um, have considered themselves not just strictly Jewish, but because of intermarriage. Um, would, you know, 1.7 million Jewish people now have some interaction with some type of Christian faith in their life because of intermarriage or their grandparents are intermarried or their parents. So it's a big, big portion of Judaism now. Mm -hmm. And what used to be you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus, that report said 37% of the Jewish people <coughs> who were, who were um, in that survey said it's okay to be Jewish and believe in Jesus. Wow. Okay. So um, a lot of it, too, is because they might have a mother who's Christian and a father who's Jewish. Mm -hmm. So their understanding of this aspect has totally changed the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. And would expect going forward that, you know, right now, seven out of ten Jewish people are going to marry somebody not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So that attitude is probably going to just increase. And again, that allows somebody like me now to maybe be within instead of on the outside. 
And in Chosen People Ministries is not just the United States. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We are worldwide. Mm -hmm. We have, wherever there's a major Jewish um, community, we have activity. Okay. And it changes depending on where we are, because our activities in Israel, mm -hmm. which we have in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, are totally different than our activities in Russia. We are in the UK, France. Uh, 700,000 Jewish people in France. It's one of the largest Jewish communities in Europe. But some of our most exciting work right now is in Israel because in Israel there's a tension because it seems to be you're either orthodox or secular. Okay. And there's a lot of tension between those two groups. But because of the big, big numbers of secular Jewish people in Israel, again, allowing the idea that you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus and Israel is a wide open um, field for, for us right now and a lot, a lot of Jewish people are opening up their hearts to Jesus. It's probably our biggest and most um, fruitful field right now in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. I won't spend too much time yeah. on this, but just to, just to get your thoughts briefly, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about sort of uh, the United States and their relationship with Israel? Have things kind of, um, <laughs> you know, so yeah. we won't, you know, we're not going to talk too, too much politics, but uh, is from the Jewish perspective, what do you, how do you feel about Let's make it theological, okay? Because <laughs> okay. right. uh, there's a verse in the Bible that God told Abraham, I'll bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of Christians that have always believed that the blessings in the United States had a lot to do with us standing with Israel. Mm -hmm. From a personal standpoint, my family came from Russia in the 1880s, uh, early 1900s. Uh, millions of Jewish people escaped Russia and came here to the United States because mm -hmm. Israel was not open yet. Mm -hmm. Tremendous blessing to our, our country. Not only what, did, did millions of people get saved from the Holocaust because of that, I believe that God blessed the United States because the United States opened up their arms to Jewish people. And it seems to be that the United States was always Israel's best friends. So I think Israel benefits from that because, as you see, the rest of the world doesn't somehow want Israel to live where they are. And we're not going to be political. The question is, did God promise that land to, to, to Israel? And if you look in the Jewish scriptures in the Bible, Genesis uh, chapter 12, 15, 18, makes it very clear that God chose the people. Mm -hmm. He gave them a land and he gave them a promise that one day the Messiah would come through you. Uh, Mitch, what would you say, um, so, so you're, you're, you're still you're fully Jewish, yep. you've now believed in Jesus, what, what difference does that make? What is, the, what is the difference between what Jesus has taught, hmm. what the gospel is all about, and what Judaism is all about? The law gospel hmm. distinction. What, what is, so how has is, how is your life changed or how has your belief changed? I mean, is it, it, it's not just you've tacked on Jesus to, to your Jewish faith, it's something very significant about that. What's, what's the difference? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Rick, growing up, I, I would always ask my, my papa, my mom's dad, we're called the chosen people, but what were we chosen for? Mm. It was always something that it was always on my mind because I knew we're the chosen people. But what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And nobody ever really had a good answer. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have a funny answer in Judaism. We're, we're chosen to suffer because it seems for the last 2,000 years living outside of Israel, wherever we went, we suffered. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't enough for me. So when I embraced Jesus and understood that God chose the Jewish nation to bring this message to the world, that made perfect sense to me. And that's when I realized, yeah, God created the Jewish people. He chose them not to be better or just distinct, but to have a message. So I would say that when I found out that that message of Jesus being the Messiah was for everybody and that God intended the Jewish people to bring it, that made perfect sense to me. And that brought my understanding of being Jewish, you know, full. I understood that I could be Jewish. I understand that I could bring this message to Jewish people and the world. And that is really what God always, I believe, intended for the Jewish people. What, what uh, here's the, kind of the crux of the question, uh, Mitch. What yeah. difference does, does having a Messiah make? If somebody says, okay, you have a Messiah, I don't. We both believe in God. What does the Messiah do for us? What is the point of having the Messiah come? If you say someone says, I'm still waiting for him, right. he's already come, 
How does that affect eternity? How does it affect life and death? Yeah. How does it affect our lives? Well, let's make it Jewish, because Jewish people will say, Jesus is good for Gentiles, but we're still waiting for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is, is that the Bible says that all have fallen short of God and we're sinners. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you deal with your sin? Mm -hmm. You know, in Judaism, we're told God has a scale. Mm -hmm. So you work it out yourself. And that seems to be pretty consistent with almost other faith system. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, be a good person. And that, you know, God will look at that and he'll want you to go to heaven. Jesus came and said, it's not quite that way. It's not what you do, it's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So the gospel message quite clearly says that everyone is a sinner. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And that God gave the world, Jesus, to die for their sins so that it's a gift. Mm -hmm. And by believing, <coughs> in fact, in the Gospel of John, and most people have probably seen, even Jewish people, the 316 sign, John 316. Mm -hmm. Why that? Because they want you to go read that in the New Testament that said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Very, very clear statement that, what do you mean by perishing? Well, your sins will make you perish. You're separated from God. And that God's solution is, I want you close to me, so if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and understand that you can't do it yourself, then you are part of God's kingdom. And you know as well as I do, most people want to think that they can save themselves. Mm -hmm. To some works of their own, some obedience of our own, some rituals, whatever it is that we do in order to be saved. Correct. Where you're saying Jesus' message was... It's what he's done. What he did on the cross. Now, does that mean that we don't want to do good works? I do. Not to be saved, but as a response to God saving me. Mm -hmm. I want to tell others about it. I want to do good. I want for a Baptist church to do good in the community. Mm -hmm. Not because we're trying to work out our salvation. Uh, you and I have had talks that I want Havel to understand that we'll just take First Baptist Church because that's where we worship, mm -hmm. can be part of the solution of a better life in Havel. Mm -hmm. We have groups in First Baptist Church that deal with people who are coming out of prison. We have groups, uh, Open Hearts Ministry, that will deal with people who are homeless. That I think that we handle some of those community problems, even though we bring faith in, uh, at a very, very good level for our community to make it better for everybody here. You know, and then we also have a place that people can come and worship right here in Havel and, um, and meet others in the community who do that and spread that good news out. Good. good. And, and that, you would say that's an area where we could certainly unite with people of varying different beliefs is to help the community. Absolutely. So we don't have to agree on how we're saved, how, how we, our belief in God, to, in order to unite to help the community. Exactly, because, okay. you know, is crime is something that everybody deals with in Havel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is homelessness? Yes, because we do have homeless people here. And I think that the faith community can come together and have good solutions mm -hmm. and actually sometimes better solutions because, you know, I, um, I think we've seen this in the past where when the church gets involved in some things and people are putting their whole energy into it, we're doing it because of love. Mm -hmm. And when people feel loved, on the fringes, I think that they just understand, of, you know, and it makes them feel better. It gives them an opportunity that I want that one day. And I think that that is certainly part of our message, mm -hmm. you know, that God loves them regardless of where they are. So if, even if you're somebody who's had a baby out of wedlock, right, yeah. God loves you. You know, he's not casting you away. Even if you there and you've committed some heinous crime, God still loves you. That is a beautiful message to give to our community, mm -hmm. you know, that you can be forgiven and then become part of the community to make it better for the next person. Yeah. yeah. There's no, you know, there's, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Absolutely. doesn't matter how far you've fallen, how far, how, what your sins are, you can be reconciled through the cross. That's right. the beauty, of, I think, of, of Jesus' message, is that anyone can be welcomed right. to him. And you would say, uh, Mitch, you know, we're, we're seeking to help the community. Um, we're we're uh, so at our church, um, and this is not necessarily about your Jewish ministry, just in general. Right. That we're we're feeding feeding hungry people. We're giving away bathroom supplies, free mm -hmm. clothing. Right now, we're able to do everything free, free counseling, even free job training. Um, do we do that with a desire that people 
become Christians? Or is that tainting the motive for trying to help their community? Um, I, want, I want everybody in the world to come to believe in Jesus. Okay. Because I believe if you don't, then you're not going to be part of his kingdom when he comes back and you're not uh, been reconciled with God with your sins. So my desire is that everybody in the world come to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now again, I'm not going to force everybody. So I want my message to go out. Do I want somebody who's homeless to come to believe in Jesus? Yes. Mm -hmm. Am I going to manipulate them to believe in Jesus? Absolutely not. Because mm -hmm. I believe that Jesus is the answer. Why? Because if you're homeless and you embrace Jesus, he will help you. He will help you deal with your abandonment. He will help you overcome addiction. I had addiction. I am no longer an addict. I do no drugs. I don't drink. And I'm not an alcoholic. So I know that that came from Jesus taking it away. Mm -hmm. So I want our community to know that Jesus is the solution, mm -hmm. not the, you know, not the barrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, I want every Jewish person in our community to come to believe in Jesus because I want them to embrace God in a way that they're not doing it right now. But I'm never going to force anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I call it an open door, absolutely. right? An open door that anybody can come. And do we insist that people believe in Jesus to, to use our um, um, groups and organization? No. You don't even have to be Christian and come to the service on Sunday. Right. In fact, we, we, we're hoping more non-Christian people come because we want to show them about Jesus and, and let, answer the questions they might have. You know, I've heard mm. it said, uh, Mitch, that we, mm. it's always a hope uh, when, you are, when you're yeah. sort of giving, you know, serving the community, mm. loving the community. It's always a hope that they come to believe. Right. Uh, but it's never an ultimatum. Exactly. Words, we would never, ever turn anyone away and, and say, unless you believe, as we believe, we're not giving you bathroom supplies. I mean, that's never the case. It's open to everyone. But it is, as you said, it is our hope that, that people would come to know him because it's, it's a wonderful relationship to know him. It is. And I don't want to manipulate anybody because that's not good for the person. Mm -hmm. If you manipulate somebody to believe in God, do they really believe? Mm -hmm. And you and I both know that that's, you know, um, something that each person has to deal with their personal faith with, with God themselves. Yeah. We can point the way, but we can't do it for them. Good. Well, we're getting close to wrapping up, okay. um, but uh, you've been in Haverhill for a lot of, you, you know, 11 years, you said. Your kids go to public school in Haverhill, like, so you're pretty yeah. tied into the, to the city. What's your, uh, what's your hope for Haverhill, Mitch? What would you want to see in the upcoming years? And well, Haverhill has been a place where I hope that uh, will be a place that we can have divergent ideas and be able to express them. Mm -hmm. I would love if there's any Jewish uh, people uh, watching this show and want to come to know a little bit more about Jesus. I'm not saying you have to convert or you have to do anything, but if you wanted to know more, you know, uh, call First Baptist Church, uh, Google Chosen People Ministry, even Google my name, Mitch Foreman, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. uh, but my hope is that this community will be a place that would bring the light of Jesus to, to, to our community in ways that we're seen as part of our community, not just a place that people go on Sundays, mm -hmm. okay? I want to be used in the community, you know? So, uh, for example, Rick, there's a couple of friends that I have in the funeral business mm -hmm. that if somebody gets buried who is Jewish but maybe not going to be buried in a Jewish cemetery, mm -hmm. um, the rabbi might not bury him in a non-Jewish cemetery. I can help that family. Mm -hmm doesn't matter if you believe or not, I can be a solution to maybe something that's very difficult at that time. Mm -hmm. Even marriage. There are a lot of people who are contemplating getting married, who are from a mixed marriage. I'll be very happy to talk to you about maybe performing that marriage mm -hmm. because I can incorporate both Jewish and Christian. So there's a uniqueness to my ministry that I think I can be a help to those who are living in a, a diverse community. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I would like that uh, the, the leaders of our community would embrace First Baptist Church as a place that we can help. Yeah. I would love for the mayor to come and see what we do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Not, not uh, just to say, oh, wow, look at how good you guys are, but that I would want him to know that we can do some things very, very uh, important for our community that will overall benefit everybody. Okay. All right. Well, as we come to a close, uh, one yeah. last question for you, yes. Mitch. Um, Patriots or Hawks? 
Um, I'm a Patriots guy. Okay, so you should be. All right, that's excellent. where that's my hat's going to be. We'll see when this yeah. airs. Hopefully, by the time this airs, we'll have a we'll have a, yeah. another championship ring. Great. Mitch, it's been a great great to have you. Thanks so much for thank for you, coming Pastor out. Rick. I appreciate it's being your first guest and many many years of this uh, program examining the tough questions and giving people opportunities to express what they believe. Thank you. Absolutely great. Thank you very much.